Other reforms that were considered desirable at an aggregate level were often considered to have undesirable distributional consequences. In many such cases, reforms were purchased by compensating losers from the budget. There's a legitimate role for using the budget in this way, with some qualifications, of course. First, the reform should be worth the cost of the compensation involved. That's pretty obvious. Second, the payment should ease rather than hinder the necessary adjustment process. That too is obvious, but rather difficult to achieve. By the early 1980s, it was clear that real wages growth had outpaced productivity growth and that that was contributing to a persistently high unemployment rate. In an accord with the trade union movement, the government of the day provided income tax reductions and other social wage payments for the benefit of workers in return for real wage restraint. This allowed a sustained period of real wage moderation, which was an important factor behind the very considerable reduction in the unemployment rate late in that decade, that is late in the 1980s. Similarly, it was considered that in the absence of appropriate compensation arrangements, the introduction of the goods and services tax would have had a disproportionate adverse impact on some sectors of the community. Tax cuts and other compensation payments were used to address these distributional issues and to smooth the implementation of the reforms. A third example, an important element of the effective implementation of the national competition policy reforms in the 1990s was progressive national competition payments from the Commonwealth to the states. The rationale for these payments was that while the states were primarily responsible for the implementation of the national competition policy reforms, the benefits would be shared broadly, shared broadly throughout the national economy. The payments provided a way of distributing the benefits of reform in a manner that had political traction. The creative and active use of the budget in the structural reform process has made an important contribution to Australia's well-being. Let me conclude. The Whitlam government can be seen in retrospect as having been responsible for a permanent increase in the size of Australian government. There's been a lot of interest over the several decades since Whitlam in the economic consequences of larger government and the appropriate role of fiscal policy in a modern economy. Much of that interest on both sides of some quite intense debates has been ideological. But it would be fair to say that both the intensity and ideological content of the debates has abated over time. One reason for that is a growing interest in the microeconomics of the national budget. That growing interest is a good thing. Currently, it's being hampered significantly by deficiencies in measurement. Deficiencies in measuring inputs, outputs, and most importantly, outcomes. There is a need for better measurement. From a Treasury perspective, all of the micro-level detail in the spending and taxation decisions in the national budget are relevant to the well-being of Australians. They should be intended to contribute to the ability of Australians to build capabilities that would allow them to choose lives that they have reason to value. Reforms we implement today build the capacity for governments of the future to assist Australians in this way. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Dr Henry. Uh, John Keogh from the Financial Review. Just interested in your final few comments about um, we need a better measurement in the budget of the microeconomic micro effects of some of the policy decisions. Is that something that Treasury would be pushing and keen to see? No, I, I wasn't saying that we needed better measurement in the budget. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, my comments were more directed to the way that uh, we measure outputs and outcomes at an aggregate level in the national accounts and in other indicators of economic performance. Um, it's not that the measures in the budget are deficient. They do a pretty good, well they may be, but not in this sense. They do a pretty good job of um, estimating the inputs. But my interest uh, is in the connection between those inputs and the outcomes that are ultimately <coughs> achieved. And it's in the gap between well, the gap that exists is in our understanding of the way in which the inputs impact on outputs and then, of course, on outcomes that, that the policy is presumably designed to pursue. And in the speech, I gave a couple of examples of uh, deficiencies in the measurement of outputs uh, that um, uh, somewhat hamper our ability <coughs> 
to uh, analyse policy interventions and their, and their efficacy even before they're implemented. So it would be more of a national accounts measurement, would it? Yeah, I think so. There's, um, there's quite a lot of work going on around the world at the moment that's focused on these questions. Interestingly, this is not a new um, perspective on national accounts. Um, uh, generations of economists, um, ever since the national accounts were first constructed, have pointed to some of the deficiencies in measurement, particularly in the services sector, and, and more particularly in the area of public service provision. Um, uh, and uh, in more recent times, uh, perhaps associated with uh, a growing questioning around the world of the importance of, or the value of growth per se, I have to be very careful with my words here, but, but there has been a growing interest around the world in the, in the value of growth per se. Uh, associated with that, there's been some re-questioning. It's not, it's not new questioning, it's some re-questioning of some concerns that have been around in the economics profession, at least the academic economics profession, uh, with several seminal contributions over the decades from, uh, from several Nobel Prize winning economists um, that have questioned the extent to which the national accounts provide <coughs> a sufficient indicator of economic progress. The Australian Bureau of Statistics has made uh, a major contribution uh, internationally to um, uh, addressing some of these deficiencies through its uh, uh, Measures of Australian Progress report. Uh, the Productivity Commission has made some contributions in particular areas um, in, um, in improving our understanding of the outcomes of various uh, interventions and in addressing some of the deficiencies of um, gross domestic product as an indicator of economic progress. For an organisation like the Australian Treasury that is very serious about providing policy advice to government that increases the well-being of the Australian population, um, to the extent that those aggregate measures of progress are deficient in, in this respect or in, indeed in several other respects that I could talk about, that's, that's something that um, we have to take a keen interest in, and indeed we have. We've taken quite a, quite a strong interest in these uh, developments and have, in our own way, contributed to recent international work that hopefully, over time, can lead to a more sophisticated set of national accounts. I've spoken here about some limitations of the national accounts in the social area. I could equally, in fact, in fact, uh, uh, perhaps more than equally, uh, have referred to some deficiencies in the environmental space. Um, and uh, uh, there's quite a lot of interest in academic circles, but also a growing interest in policy circles in addressing some of those deficiencies of measurement.